notes number five on time series operators, um, where um, we'll uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, this uh, uh, Fourier transform, discrete Fourier transform, and as we actually use it, the fast Fourier transform or FFT. Uh, that is uh, going to become uh, one of our tools and uh, a very important tool. So here are some uh, common functions or transforms, okay, as as I might term them, that we use on uh, one-dimensional uh, time series or spatial series, and I'll talk about it in terms of uh, you know of single seismograms and what we can do with those. That's really what the first half of the class is about. Then we start putting uh, you know, reflection seismograms together into 2D sections, and that's what the second half of the class is about. So um, uh, we've learned now to efficiently uh, be able to Fourier transform our, our uh, you know, even very long data sets into, um, uh, into the uh, frequency domain from the time domain, and we can go back. Uh, and it's all a mathematically uh, perfect operation. And actually, by doing less calculation, fewer multiplications, fewer additions, um, the, the fast Fourier transform actually has, in, in, in computers, if we're using only, say, single precision um, uh, floating point uh, numbers, the fast Fourier transform will give you a more accurate result. It'll be more numerically accurate. Uh, there will be, you know, less underflow, less overflow, less uh, um, um, less inaccuracy. You know, you'll be able to preserve, you know, whereas if you do n squared operations uh, on on uh, numbers that have accuracy out to the sixth decimal place uh, only, you know, as as single precision numbers do, uh, if you do n squared operations, you're going to lose. Um, um, Two or three uh, decimal places of uh, of accuracy, and that may not be bad, but uh, you know you, you do that enough times, and and you uh, you start to feel the effects, um, and you'll see it even in in your uh, you know the principal data uh, mantissa. Um, but the fast Fourier transform, you know, since it can uh, it takes way fewer multiplications, you know, only. Uh, Capital N, the length of the time series uh, times the uh, log of the base two of capital N. Um, that's way less uh, 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 multiplications, many fewer, and it will uh, give you. You only lose one, um, you know, maybe one or two of those uh, decimal places of, of accuracy. So it's actually the the fast Fourier transform, you know, as implemented in a computer on. Um, um, on uh, single precision numbers, anyway, um, is um, is actually uh, more accurate than uh, than a DFT. Um, and and this is, uh, I mean, to computer scientists, this is a ridiculous problem uh, because they just say, okay, just do everything in uh, um, do everything in um, in double precision. And then you've got you know you've got acres more of, of decimal places to uh, to lose and to no effect. Um, and uh, the problem is is that we are we are still uh, recording, using, archiving, um, you know, getting data out of archives uh, that is uh, um, single precision floating point because our our measurement devices and techniques. Are absolutely not capable of producing anything that's really worth, um, uh, really worth having in double precision. You know, it's just not worth the storage space because there's no there's no data out there in that that second four bytes of of uh, uh, of uh, in a double precision number. So um, uh, you know, we feel perfectly justified in in, uh, in ignoring it. It's uh, you know. Uh, so we would actually have to change our, uh, uh, you know, gut and change almost all of our software to, uh, you know, to use uh, dull precision numbers in the internal calculations, and then they gotta, you know, to to write out data in any 
of the agreed formats, uh, 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 you know, seed format for uh, earthquake seismograms. Uh, Seg Y, which is still, um, you know, uh, it's still accepted by uh, the Pascal Data Center, and it is absolutely the the Society of Exploration Geophysicists Data Exchange Format Y is still, you know, the way you get data uh, from industry and the way you give results back to them. That's, there's no question, and that's all single precision. Um, so um, uh, there's uh, uh, there's really uh, uh, it would really take a, a total sea change, uh, and maybe what we need is better compilers, really, uh, to recognize, uh, you know, when we uh, when we can, you know, um, and better, uh, you know, we need better code that that recognizes data formats. This issue of 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 data format, especially binary data formats like SegY and Seed and all that, it's a uh, it's a constant um, aggravation for all of us, and, and you know, for you and your graduate careers here, it's going to be it's going to be a very real aggravation uh, that you have to deal with. Um, and so, we do need much better software that can, you know, there are ways of automatically recognizing, you know, what format, what binary format, what what standard, you know, everything that our data sit in, and. Um, it ought to be possible to uh, to have software that uh, automatically recognizes uh, uh, exactly what you've got and uh, uh, and deals with it appropriately. Uh, but we don't have it yet. Even the uh, even the codes that people uh, companies pay a quarter million dollars for cannot automatically recognize um, uh, different formats of, of even you know something as general as as simple. As seismogram data, can't do it. Um, but that is a hugely needed innovation. Um, okay. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, what are we going to want to be doing with all this data that uh, we are uh, we're accumulating? Uh, you know, what are some useful? Uh, what have proven to be some very useful? Um, uh, functions. Okay, we're going to talk about. Uh, we talked a lot about the FFT, the Fourier transform. Um, I have introduced convolution as a as a method of, of applying a filter. Okay, so anything you can imagine you might do with filters is um, is uh, uh, handled essentially by convolution. Um, there is. Um, uh, the autocovariance, or, or as I more often call it, the autocorrelation. Okay, um, and uh, that is a uh, uh, an extremely useful technique. It's the the uh, operator behind the whole viber size technique. Which um, uh, let's see, most seismic data these days are recorded offshore, um, and um, probably. Um, um, probably ninety percent of it anymore is uh, still recorded with uh, uh, with uh, what we used to call air guns, but uh, um, we really have to talk about them uh, these days as uh, bubblers uh, because uh, um, you know if you uh, if you use that gun image, then then uh, you know people who. Yes, yes. People get very worried about what you're doing, um, and uh, I even saw a claim recently that the um, uh, that a survey uh, off uh, California that Graham uh, is uh, getting involved in, um, you know, is is has has an environmental impact statement that um, you know allows the deaths of uh, of you know numbers of whales, and. Um, I, I have a hard time believing that that's that that you know that that EIS would uh, would have been approved with that, uh, but you know just giving them the ability to raise the question, uh, you know, shows just how sensitive this issue is. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I I can't believe you know there there's uh, there's all kinds of laws that say uh, <clears throat> you know if you spot a marine mammal within uh, you know. Uh, 
within miles and miles of your seismic survey, you shut down. Okay, so um, it's uh, uh, I, I just can't believe that the EIS allows that. That's a it's a federal law. Um, but okay, um, ten percent of marine work is um, is being done with um, uh, with what's called uh, uh, chirp devices. Okay, and we've used chirp here to great effect in the lakes of uh, Western Nevada, Eastern California. Um, and you know, if um, if it's true that the uh, marine mammal people have have are, are pointing out things we really have to worry about. You know, if those EISs really are having to state, uh, you know, numbers of whale deaths, then uh, we're going to have to go to ninety percent. Um, you know, they're going to have to build bigger, bigger, deeper sounding chirp devices, and and uh, that's how we're going to um, um, that's how we're going to um, uh, be doing marine seismic surveys in the future. And and the chirp device, the chirp technology, is is based. You know, really fundamentally on the autocorrelation. Okay, same with uh, on land vibrosize. Okay, which is ninety five percent of uh, on land surveys. Um, the uh, the idea is is like your cell phone. Um, you you don't you don't try to blast your data, your signal all at once. Okay, you don't try to make an explosion, a spike. You you uh, you put in a gentle, long-lasting signal that has a, a very tight autocorrelation. I'll explain all that. All right, um, but basically, it, it, it gives you the um, you know a a, a vibrosized machine with uh, um, with uh, uh, eighty thousand pound uh, hold down force and four ton uh, reaction mass <coughs> is still a lot smaller force than um, uh, than uh, uh, an explosion. Okay, it, you know, smaller by many orders of magnitude. Okay, you know, the you get um, um, let's see, uh, you know, four tons spread over uh, a two square meter plate or three square meter plate. Uh, what? That's probably. Um, that's probably no more than a hundred bars of pressure, okay, on the ground, and so that's not going to break up the street, or, um, uh, or, or you know, put deep holes into your into the farmer's road, okay. Um, whereas an explosion, you know, it breaks and vaporizes rocks, so we're talking megabars here, okay. So, so you know, four orders of magnitude at least in terms of force. Um, your cell phone, you know, you've got a little battery in your pocket, and uh, it can talk to a cell tower ten miles away, and it does that by extending the signal over a, a long duration, um, and that's why you can have a milliwatt cell phone, um, and uh, uh, you know, instead of having to have a, uh, um, uh, a you know, a hundred, you know, carry a hundred watt uh, radio transmitter. Which you couldn't carry in your pocket. <clears throat> You'd be carrying a car battery all the whole time. So uh, um, autocorrelation um, has been a, a, a huge advance in geophysics, in uh, uh, in communication, lots of fields. Uh, did you know that uh, GPS transmitters on the sat satellites? they trans each GPS satellite. There's 26 of them. Is only transmitting at 50 watts. It's 400 kilometers away. Okay, and that's why when you turn on your your handheld GPS, you've got to wait. Uh, you know, a good new one, you still got to wait 10 seconds to get a lock. It's receiving those extended signals and auto correlating them. Okay, um, got to wait at least 10 seconds. Uh, you used to have to wait several minutes. Um, cross correlation. Uh, is very useful, uh, especially in the last ten years. Um, uh, it's kind of revolutionized uh, the science of seismology. Okay, and this concept of empirical Green's functions is uh, uh, is it, really bringing a lot of new ideas. It hasn't cross correlation has not. Um, I mean, it's related to autocorrelation, obviously, but it hasn't. Uh, 
hasn't brought uh, uh, new technological advances yet necessarily, um, but uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's uh, uh, certainly re revolutionizing our science. So it will bring new technology. Um, and later on, I'll talk about a uh, uh, transform called the Hilbert transform. And this is uh, useful to us, um, uh, especially industry uh, seismologists use it uh, every day um, to do what are called uh, uh, instantaneous attributes, seismogram attributes. And that's what the Hilbert transform is quite useful for. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to that. OK, now. Um, uh, convolution, okay. We have expressed it already in five different ways, okay. Here's five different ways you can write convolution, and uh, I think uh, in lab two you're asked to uh, to write certain operations in, in in at least some of these different ways. All right. Now the thing the thing uh, I need to point out here is that this time t on the output of the convolution. That's uh, what I might call a lag, and and often I uh, um, I will uh, I will I will uh, say it's a uh, you know I, I'm really I'm really just saying you know y of t that means it's a you know y the output of the convolution is a time series, uh, and so the axis is some kind of time, and if I want to be more specific about what that axis is, I'm going to call it a uh, I'm going to call it a uh, a lag, okay. Uh, it's kind of an offset between the two series that are being convolved. Same thing applies to the uh, the uh, covariance and the and the uh, autocovariance. Okay, so we are uh, integrating uh, two time series here. This is the you know closed form continuous integral expression. We're integrating over uh, tau, and uh, we're we're using this uh, lag um, t here, okay. Um, so the filter, there's the filter time series, uh, which is being, you know, for every single, you know, time point that we want in the output, we got to do the whole integral, okay, uh, which involves n computations, big n computations. So you know, if you're going to have the same number of uh, samples in your in your output, in your filtered output. You're you're essentially talking here about uh, two uh, n squared uh, computations. All right. Here's a shorthand way of writing it. Um, you know, f convolved with x. And if these were complex, you know, the order matters. If f or x is complex, the order does matter. Convolution is is for of complex signals is not um, uh, not in general commutative. Um, <clears throat> and so this is, you know, the way I write it. This is the way it would be ordered in the uh, in the continuous um, uh, integral. And then here is a uh, discrete uh, convolution. You know, you can write your pro computer program based on this. Uh, instead of tau, we have i now as the um, uh, as the time index inside the summation. And then k is our lag. And here here's this summation makes it clear that uh, you know it's going to take n squared operations to do the full convolution. Um, here is convolution expressed as a uh, uh, in terms of z polynomials, and it's multiplying two z polynomials together as you've you've already done for lab one. Okay, and then taking the omega definition of z, we see that. Uh, the Fourier transform of the convolved output y, you know, in the omega domain, the frequency domain, is equal to at, at each frequency, it is the product of two complex numbers. One of them is the Fourier transform of the filter time series at that frequency omega, and then the other one, we're multiplying it by the Fourier transform capital X of the um, Input um, time series at the same omega. Okay, uh, so the entire you know if if you want to sample if you start with uh, um, 
uh, capital N uh, samples of omega, and of course we already explained why we would why we would use capital N samples of omega when we have capital N samples of of time. Okay, so yes, you, you, if you have capital N samples of omega, notice that this this operation here, you know, is exactly one uh, Fourier transform per omega component. So there's only n multiplications here, not n squared. So if we have it in the in the frequency domain, it's pretty easy, pretty quick. Um, all right, auto covariance. All right, first closed form integral. All right, uh, we take the uh, uh, again generalizing to, to allow our inputs and everything to be uh, to be uh, complex. It's um, x conjugate times x at the at the lag. Okay. So this is still a, ta a, a lag, but now I'm calling the, the time coordinate of the autocorrelated auto uh, output, I'm calling it tau, uh, just because I'm used to calling it tau. Um, so uh, you know, we're integrating over t in here. Uh, you know, so you know, I, don't know, I don't know why I did that. I mean, I could call it uh, tau up here for convolution and uh, and integrate over t inside, you know, just switching around my variables. Sorry about that. Um, I think I'm probably doing it the way Clairbout does it, and he must have his reasons, but I, I, I failed to divine why, why he switches them between these two. Um, OK, probably some deeper reason that I don't understand yet. Um, <clears throat> so you can see it's, it's really just like the square of the uh, um, uh, you know, the, the autocovariance is like squaring the time series, one way to think of it. Um, except there is, uh, you know, there is the, uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of, of, you know, one leg of the square is, uh, is uh, you take the, uh, uh, the complex conjugate. Uh, and of course, that doesn't matter, okay? So, but but remember, square with a lag. This uh, t plus tau coordinate, time coordinate is really important. Uh, okay, and then um, I can use here. Here's how to represent in in uh, uh, auto covariance in terms of conv the convolution symbol that star there. <clears throat> so it's like convolving a time reversed x. Okay, that's what x of minus t means with the complex conjugate of x. Okay, weird, but that's the way you, you can you can write it. Okay, uh, and if you look at the integrals, you'll see how that how that works. Um, all right, here's a summation uh, equation for a discrete uh, autocovariance. Uh, so we have uh, the autocovariance r at uh, at lag index tau. Right, so tau is now you know here tau is a number of seconds. Here tau is an index. Okay, you know, goes goes. Uh, it's it's it only takes an integer value, and so we're uh, summing. Okay, and um, uh, and and this also takes n squared operations, and involves uh, notice notice that the uh, uh, that x uh, is is the right right way around. There's, there's no time reversal here. Okay. It, it's only if we try to write it down as a convolution we gotta we gotta include the time reversal. It's only a time reverse relative to a convolution. But as you can see, the it, an actual autocovariance is just a straight, you know, it's like we're dot producting uh, a time series by itself, uh, and they're both in the right order. Okay, neither are time reversed. Okay, uh, in the z domain, it's uh, the product of the uh, Complex conjugate of uh, x of z, which is x bar of one over z, uh, times x of z. So it's the again, it's the product of two polynomials. And then here it is in the frequency domain. Really simple. Uh, you take the complex conjugate of the Fourier transform component at omega. That's a, that's some complex number, and you multiply it by the complex number that's the Fourier transform of x at that frequency omega, and that gives you the uh, uh, <clears throat> the complex number, which is the uh, uh, actually, look at of course, right? 
you multiply uh, any uh, complex number by its uh, complex conjugate, and it's going to be a real number. So now you know, you know, with this expression, that the autocovariance is always a real number. Okay. Why do we use R for the autocovariance? Um. Yeah, because it's connected to you know the statistics of, of normal equations and and uh, you know fitting fitting uh, data and and uh, uh, but but the and, and so you can think of it that way certainly um, but this is really extending that concept uh, the the R you you calculate um, you know when you when you fit a line to data points. Is really R at lag zero seconds. Okay, but here, here I'm telling you, you can get a whole, you can get a whole uh, R in the in at, at at any frequency you like. You can get R at uh, at any time you like, at any lag you like. Okay, so uh, that's uh, it's it's kind of an extension of that con of that concept. Okay, here's the basics behind uh, uh, Viber size. All right. So uh, um, um, let's take uh, uh, let's take a, a, a time series that has uh, a uh, you know maybe this is a reflected wavelet at some early time, and then later there's another reflected wavelet. I mean here I've drawn it larger, but of course if it's a later uh, reflection, it could could it's probably more easily smaller. Uh, and the reflected wavelet is delayed by some time tau, and it's um, um, and it's also scaled by some uh, you know say reflection coefficient alpha. Okay, and and so what we want to do, of course, uh, we we want to know how deep that uh, uh, that that reflector is, and so if we had the travel time to the reflector, then um, then we could. We could uh, um, we could figure that out um, if uh, uh, you know. And what the you know what is the reflector? Is it a uh, um, is it a highly fractured uh, you know fluid filled fault with a geothermal res resource in it, or or is it just uh, you know a transition between um, softer sandstone and harder sandstone? You know somewhere within our reservoir and. Is not really critical. Okay, so we want to get that reflection coefficient out too. Okay, so um, uh, in continuous time, you know what I've given you is an equation for uh, um, the autocovariance uh, <clears throat> in uh, um, <clears throat> in uh, uh, for transient signals. Okay. Uh, you can do an autocovariance for a, a signal that goes on infinitely, you know, like a, a sine of uh, sine of t, right? That goes on infinitely, positive to positive and negative infinity. But uh, um, uh, this is uh, meant for transient signals, and uh, uh, so you don't have to take any limits. Actually, that's uh, that's one of the things you can do. Uh, that you don't have to worry about since we we're always dealing with transient signals because they're physical phenomena. So here's you know here's this view in the computer memory. You know we have a uh, 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 you know two long we have uh, two times uh, two copies of the time series. Here's the original copy. Here's here's the the copy with the where the uh, complex conjugate's been taken. I don't know if you can see the the uh, the x bars there. Uh, maybe, <laughs> and uh, you uh, multiply the overlapping components. Uh, you know, you offset them according to the lag you're at, the tau. You multiply the overlapping uh, 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 components and add up, add up all the uh, products. And so you're taking a dot product of the overlapping uh, uh, samples, and um, and the sum is is your r at that lag. So. Uh, uh, you get what's called an absolute correlation, and um, what you hope to find is, uh, uh, you know, from this signal, we would hope to find two peaks. One, uh, there uh, there ought to be a uh, there ought to be a uh, uh, a peak at zero lag, right? Because the signal should be pretty 
uh, pretty similar to itself, right, with no lag. Um, so there will be a maximum there, and then there's going to be um, there's going to be other uh, other maxima within there, you know, at, at non-zero lags. And so for the signal we were looking at, you know, this should take a maximum at the what I might call tau zero, which would be the reflection time I'm looking for, and that I would calculate my depth from. So, uh, uh, you know, that's one example of using auto co auto covariance to uh, uh, to get some useful information. Okay. Now, now these you know these signals are pretty simple, and in you know general seismic processing, you would say, all right, I'm going to you know pick my time at the uh, um, at the center, and I'm going to compare you know the amplitudes of these peaks, and that would work. But you know, what if what if the signals are much more complex like that, like like uh, you know, you're getting a lot of ringing in the uh, near surface, and and uh, so instead of you know two peaks in one trough, every one of your uh, S signals here had uh, you know had a thousand peaks and troughs. I mean that that I've certainly recorded a lot of data like that. So uh, uh, um, that's uh, but the autocorrelation should work just as well. Okay. And and allow you to identify that travel time. Uh, just just for your uh, uh, your information, I'm I'm giving you a, a steady state uh, um, uh, signal autocorrelation definition. I don't think you're going to have to use it, but uh, there it is. Um, let's talk about the properties of uh, the autocorrelation. Okay, there uh, and one of the really important ones is uh, Schwartz's inequality. Okay. And this applies to any signal. Okay, we define it for any any kind of signal, transient, continuous. Um, doesn't matter how much noise. Doesn't matter how long the signal is. Um, uh, Schwartz's inequality should work everywhere. And what Schwartz's inequality is saying that the magnitude, right? Um, the magnitude of uh, the autocorrelation is um, uh, at at any time is less than or equal to the autocorrelation r at zero lag. Okay, so none of these side peaks can be higher than the uh, than the peak at zero lag. Okay, that's what it's saying. Uh, you know, so here let's uh, we put in the uh, the definition of the autocorrelation at tau, and uh, um, uh, here's the uh, the uh, autocorrelation at uh, zero, um, and um, let's see. Okay, and and so we have uh, uh, you know kind of a, a, a Schwartz's inequality gives us this definition as well. Um, now that was the uh, that was formally the autocovariance. Okay, and here is the autocorrelation. Now knowing that the that r at zero lag is going to be the maximum, and or at least nothing's higher than it. Uh, Formally, the autocorrelation, which I write with an R hat, is a scaled autocovariance. Okay, so what do we scale by? We we normalize by the uh, uh, by the autocor autocovariance at zero lag. Okay, so that's that's the formal definition of auto. I I actually use uh, you know use autocorrelation uh, inaccurately to mean both auto. You know, I might be talking about autocovariance. I might be talking about autocorrelation, um, but here's the actual actual difference. <clears throat> so the um, what this means is that the autocorrelation r hat at zero lag is equal to one, and then everywhere else it's uh, less than or equal to one. Okay, I should have put a less than or equal to there. Um, okay, we can express the uh, autocorrelation in the uh, in the frequency domain. We have not um, 
Um, and this theory has a name, as you can see, uh, but the derivation is not that uh, not that tough. So we we Fourier transform from from um, you know from the autocorrelation in terms of its time lag to the uh, capital R autocorrelation in the frequency domain, which which now you know is really this omega is really the lag frequency. Okay, uh, kind of a weird concept, but you know, here we have time, here we have frequency, okay? But you have to remember it is it is it did come from a lag, not a not direct time. Um, so uh, there's the definition of the autocorrelation. We surround that with a Fourier transform um, uh, uh, integral. So you can see we've uh, uh, you know there's the integral over t, there's the integral over tau. And here's our uh, uh, our auto our Fourier transform exponent e to the i omega tau okay instead of omega t, um, and uh, uh, so now you know this integral here is over tau so we can pull out uh, x conjugate of t right that's uh, constant with respect to that integral over tau so here's the tau parts. And and now look at this. Uh, uh, we we have a, an integral um, where we're uh, we're Fourier transforming e to the i omega tau, but we're transforming a shifted x, right? And it's been shifted by tau. Okay. So we apply the shift theorem from Fourier transforms, which means that um, you know this. Uh, 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 and it's actually, as you can see, just a substitution. Right, we're going to substitute this q for uh, t plus tau, right? And the uh, you know dq d uh, d tau is one, so there's there's no problem there. Um, and um, and now we have a Fourier transform from x of q, you know, times e to the i omega q dq, but it's still a Fourier transform, and 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 we just recognize that oh, that's the Fourier transform of x. Okay, of omega, and um, uh, and now this is uh, uh, um, um, let's see. So now what, what do we got? We've got a an integral of uh, of x of t times e to the i omega t dt. Um, uh, and um, if I take the uh, if I take the complex conjugate of that whole thing, what do I get? I get an integral of x conjugate of t uh, times uh, uh, e to the minus i omega t. Right. So this is just writing uh, you know writing this this integral here that surrounds it in a different way. Okay. And uh, so the x of omega is here. That's been identified from the, the substitution. And then what's left is uh, is well, that's uh, that's uh, x. Um, um, that's the Fourier transform of x in terms of omega, right? That's what that integral is is uh, recognized as. But uh, you know we got to take the complex conjugate of the whole thing. So then it just uh, it just reduces to this, and what is that? Okay, uh, that's actually the power spectrum. Remember that the power we define the, the power spectrum, which Clairbaut just calls the spectrum, as x conjugate of omega times x of omega. That's the power spectrum of x. So now we know that the the um, and I think I might have said this before. The uh, Fourier transform of the autocovariance R is the power spectrum. How about that? So, uh, and being uh, you know x conjugate times x, you know now we know that the autocorrelation is is positive definite. Uh, it can be zero, uh, but it's uh, it's always real and it's it's always uh, uh, it's always positive. So uh, uh, you know that that's uh, uh, this connection between the autocovariance and the uh, and see I should have written autocovariance here because it's not scaled, 
right? But I use autocorrelation because I'm not careful about that terminology, all right? So there's there's this uh, you know really um, terrific uh, 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 relationship between the power spectrum and the uh, um, and the auto covariance. In fact, I would I would even go so far to say that the power spectrum is the Fourier dual of the auto covariance. So if I had a uh, an auto covariance, you know, or an equation that had an auto covariance in it. And I was going to, uh, you know, Fourier transform the whole equation to uh, uh, to the frequency domain. Then all I would have to do is uh, is is write in the uh, the power spectrum instead of the instead of the auto covariance. You know, because because doing all the integrals would just would just be you know repeating this uh, this development right here. Okay. Uh, what about the z-transform of the autocorrelation? Here is the um, uh, <clears throat> the Fourier transformed input x uh, in terms of uh, z of well in terms of a uh, DFT right that's the discrete Fourier transform um, e to the i times this is still continuous omega times the index n times delta t. Okay? So it's really e to the i omega t, right? Uh, so z to the, uh, uh, and, and, and we can recognize here that we're making a definition that z to the nth power is e to the i times omega times n times delta t. Okay? Uh, okay, the complex conjugate of x of omega is. Um, um, uh, the same sum um, uh, of uh, x uh, sub n conjugate times e to the minus. You got to take the complex conjugate of the Fourier of the Euler exponential, and that's just e to the minus i omega times n times delta t, and that is now we're saying okay we've got here z to the minus n is e to the power of minus i times omega times n times delta t. So uh, uh, you know x conjugate of omega is just x conjugate of one over z, right? Because we got uh, instead of x of z, we got x of one over z. Uh, and so, and I I had forgotten in my original notes to write down the final conclusion, right? So we have uh, uh, x of omega times x conjugate of omega, and sort sort of bringing that back to the z transform, that gives us x of z multiplied by x conjugate of 1 over z. And that's, uh, that's the, uh, the autocorrelation, the, um, sorry, the autocovariance in the z domain as z polynomials. Okay. Um, here's some other uh, discrete formulas um, for uh, steady state signals. Um, but of course, you know, in discrete data, we never have infinite, an infinite amount of data. Um, and, and so here it's clear there's a scale factor of 1 over n. <clears throat> um, and, and these are the limits that your, you know, your program is going to be uh, multiplying out x conjugate at k uh, times x at, at k um, plus the lag tau. And um, you know, both of these series are, are you know, dealt with in order. No problem there. Also, there's this idea that uh, you might run into trouble around the edges. Um, you know, as your uh, as your tau gets uh, as your lag gets large, the the variance of this can really go up. So uh, you uh, you might try to scale it by n minus tau, um, the absolute value of that, to try to account for the like the overhang of your series, you know, the parts that aren't overlapping. Um, so it's just a couple different definitions, uh, but you know, I would call all of these the uh, the auto covariance. All right, I'll come back to the cross covariance um, 